Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, hello. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Weaver. Nick is a researcher from uh, ICSI at Berkeley, and uh, he will tell us about his opinions on warm defense and uh, what Microsoft could do in this arena. Um, and this talk actually consists of really two talks separated together, included in one file, or actually included as two files. Um, this first one, which is generic thoughts on warm defense, why well, I actually think there's hope. Why well, I actually believe that we can build real defenses against these things. Your mic's off. Oh. No, it's on. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, it's on. Um, why I think we can build real defenses. So this is sort of just the nice graphical explanation of the problem statement. Those who don't like us too much in our economic enemies, economic potential enemy, full of enemies, axis of evil, another axis of evil underneath. Uh, we're dealing with attacks that really only affect the first world. You want to make sure that only the evil imperialists suffer, you write a worm. Or at least that's one way. So this is just a nice little graphical thing saying who needs to worry and who shouldn't care. Um, this graph is slightly bogus. The circles are Log, the radius is log of the number of infections through geographic location. So um, large circles mean start to undercount. Um, also, sometimes you can only get to specific countries. So there really aren't that many computers in the uh, middle of the Australian outback. Um, not many kangaroos have iPods. And not many in the Amazon either, but this is the best localization that was possible. So it's a content-free graph, but it's a useful content-free graph. So this work is thoughts developed with a lot of people, but most in particular, <coughs> Vern, who's my boss at ICSI, uh, Stuart Staniford, who's now at Nevis Networks, formerly founded Silicon Defense, uh, David Moore, Colleen Shannon, and Stefan Savage of San Diego, and Dan Ellis of the MITRE Corporation. And the primary sponsorship is two National Science Foundation programs. Uh, the Center for Internet Epidemiology and Defenses, which is just funded. Um, and it's a joint project of UC San Diego and ICSI, as well as the EMIS project, which is a joint uh, DHS NSF grant. Although, of course, all these opinions are my own. So. This talk is why is there hope? Oh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, I believe that worms are the number one problem in computer security um, because they are malicious intent that can spread faster than our defenses and can penetrate through even the smallest gaps. All it takes is one person who violated protocol, connected his laptop at Starbucks, and then connects it on the inside of the firewall, and the firewall is breached. Um, and it's also malicious intent with global reach. Um, and in general, this malcode problem is all sort of merging into one pit. Spyware, scumware, viruses, et cetera, are all becoming this massive sea of disgust that we're having, disgust that we're dealing with. And worms are just simply the most powerful delivery mechanism. In military parlance, a worm is the, uh, the weapon system, the warhead can be whatever the attacker wants. Erase the hard drive, install spyware, whatever. Um, I believe that we can change the equation. That over the next couple of years, we can make worms like viruses. Uh, viruses are a persistent but manageable threat. You don't, you pay 50 bucks per system per year to Symantec or Norton or uh, McAfee or somebody else, and you, you, you can live.
live with the problem. It's persistent manageable vexation. And I think we can move worms into this category, albeit with a few thou shalt nots. Um, I'll get to it later, but thou shalt not build internet scale peer to peer may be one of the realities if uh, attackers really start leveraging this technology. You think viruses are pretty much uh, something we can live with. It really depends on the scenario. I mean, if you have a really quick outbreak, whatever we have today doesn't help. So do you consider that it's something we can live with? Uh, those tend to be not viruses, but worms. The fast outbreaks, the, the five second, 10 seconds, these are the worms. Viruses, classic viruses, in fact, files and spread with files. Those, those are really manageable. And the email viruses, email worms, are vexation, but a manageable one. Um, when I mean worms, I mean the things that really do spread worldwide in five seconds or 15 minutes. Um, so I'll start out with Wait a minute, what's scumware? Scumware is just all this. Is, is it a generic term you made up for everything? That's yeah. Like? Okay, all right. I just wondered if it was a new category of malware that I hadn't heard of. No, it just seems like appropriate because okay. calling it right. some of the stuff spyware is not right because it's Scummier than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sleazeware might be some of this global distributed Akamai content delivery system that attackers have been working towards. Attackers have been building <clears throat> content delivery systems using Trojan machines, using for distributing kitty porn. I think that qualifies as sleazeware. Um, it's all a pit. Um, distinctions really don't matter anymore. It's just evil. So worms themselves, though, do seem to come in a few types. And I'll discuss those to start with. And then the concept of a reactive versus a static defense and why my research is focused on reactive defenses. Um, components of a worm defense, what all are the pieces needed to build a defense system? The difference between containment and blocking, these are two different response strategies that dictate how you structure the defense and signatures, which are tools for driving defenses. Um, the OODA loop, which is a wonderful concept from the military, which is how to model adversaries' thought process with time as a factor. And then perimeters, which are how to model your defense in space. And so taking it together, what are the implications? What do the defenses have to look like? And sample defense of stuff that we're working on at ICSI that should be deployable in the next year or two that will stop an entire class of worms, both for home users and businesses. So the key insight is different classes have different behaviors. And the class of distinction that we developed is based on how do you find new victims. That a worm somehow must find another system before it can infect it. So scanning worms are the most common. Blaster, Welshia, Slammer, Witty, all these major outbreaks that have spread worldwide quickly that don't involve uh, email have been scanning worms for the most part. And they pick random addresses for some variation of random and try to infect them. Um, hit list words use a pre-generated list of targets. So the Worm author a priori knows that these are victims, and it goes out and attacks them. Um, topological worms use local information. The original Morris internet worm was topological. It looked through the network yellow pages, found other victims to attack, and attacked them. Metaserver worms contact some service that tells you about victims. So for example, say you're writing a worm that's attacking web servers. How do you find new web servers? Well, just ask Google. Query for a couple of random keywords or the particular string that indicates a vulnerability. Google happily replies and tells you who to attack. Um, and finally, there are passive worms that respond to communication with an attack. So it's like somebody imagine the following uh, influenza strain. You walking down the street, you're infected with it. Somebody else comes up and talks to you, and influenza causes you to sneeze on them. And now they're infected. That's a passive attack. 
Passive attacks can actually be very slow if it's involving humans or can be very fast. Take, for example, a peer-to-peer -peer system where the response to a query can be an infection. This may spread very fast if the peer-to-peer -peer system is pretty well used. Or it may be very slow if nobody uses it. Are there examples of hitless worms? Yes. Uh, witty, the witty worm released last March, the attacker used a hit list of about 100 machines. Um, the interesting thing for witty is how did the attacker acquire the list of machines to target? Since you can't scan for the vulnerability, the attacker had inside knowledge of who ISS's customers were and their location on the internet. But we have seen all these classes of worms we've seen in the wild. Like my, uh, my doom and those kind of... Those we generally things. consider male viruses. They usually require human interaction so they spread slower. And they're either male viruses or if they execute automatically when your male agent receives it, we'd call them a male worm. Those tend to be topological in nature because they're looking through the local address book. Oh, you don't consider that a hit list? Mm -mm. It grabs the oh, the book. sucker list on my doom would be a hit list because right. there, there was hit listing from my doom as well. Yes, you're right. So we've seen hit lists in two contexts. Um, spamming out the worm to you know who are idiots who will probably run it or just waiting and uh, witty. So. So Witty infected only 100 machines? Uh, no, Witty infected uh, about 10,000. Um, the initial seed population was 100. Ah. Um, and about 60, 70 <coughs> of the initial targets were actually at a single military installation. So Witty was also a cyber attack on the US government. So. A reactive and a static defense. A static defense is a wall. I build this wall, put up the barbed wire, put up the concertina wire, and then just walk away and ignore it. So you construct the defense, you put it into place. The attacker gets his chance to do whatever he wants, and either the defense works or fails. And there's really no in between in the static defense. Um, our current defensive posture against worms is static. We use keep the patches up, keep these virus updates, but these updates don't change more than once a day. So our current posture is very much focused around static defenses. Reactive defense is a little different. It's I build up this wall, build up the concertina wire, and then hire a bunch of uh, Marines with M16s and put alarms along the fence. And now if an attacker comes through, my defenses are able to respond to the attack and yes, the defense may require some sacrifice. Some Marines got killed. The attackers were able to penetrate a little bit before I forced them out. But reactive defenses tend to be more resilient because you're able to respond to the conditions by changing your, def and changing your defense and hopefully winning while minimizing the loss. Um, so at the cost of being imperfect, a, resilient, or a reactive defense can be more resilient. Personal bias for me, yes? Nick, when you say resilient, do you mean that there's a human in there adapting the system? No, that there are automatic systems adapting. So, so I guess that's, I mean, I guess it's more resilient in the sense that there's more behaviors that it can exhibit, but it's still static in the sense that if the adversary is a, a human, that uh, unless you've got AI there, right, the human can, can beat it eventually, right? Because it's- But it's I'm not building, but, but if the attacker is human, then I can have humans in the loop on defense to create the resilient re reactive defense. What I, why I need to make automatic defenses is my attacks are too fast. OK, gotcha. Is there an example of a system? Is there a system that does that today? Or is that uh, research? I will talk about one near the end that gives you containment for scanning worms. So you accept that the firewall mostly works, and you limit the infection. Um, I have a personal bias towards reactive defenses. I believe resilience is useful. The other thing is reactive defenses are cheaper because I have one surefire detector of a worm, and that's infected systems. So um, reactive defenses may be easier because I ha have this possibility of detecting that a worm's going on and doing something about it. 
Um, and finally, I admit it, I'm a researcher. I'm here to have fun. And reactive defenses are more cool. Because don't you agree it would be neat to have your system, your network, have all these little agents running around, seeing that it's under attack, and responding with the counterattack, blocking systems, stopping traffic? It's like something out of a cyberpunk novel. So uh, I have this bias. I like reactive defenses. So the components of a reactive defense, the reactive part of the defense, are detection, analysis, and response. So detection is just discovery of the new worm. And the key for discovery is to key on particular behavior of worms, exploits, or common implementations. That is, key in on behavior necessary for a self-propagating attack. Um, and so the goal is there's an infinite number of possible worms. But if I look at this behavioral class, this is an infinitely large subspace of all possible worms. And so I get these subspaces and try to block them. Um, automatic analysis. This is the glue that holds together a reactive defense. Um, are, is there a worm? What are its properties? Um, it can be very crude. Like a detector could just trigger an immediate response. It could trigger a non-local response. Or it could be very sophisticated. So one thing that we're working on is an automatic analysis engine that can really take a worm, propagate it in a controlled environment, and see what it does. And then, of course, response is uh, change the network to prevent further infection or to remove existing infections. Um, and there are two response strategies that I will discuss later. And these three components are needed to make a reactive defense. If you lack any one of these, you can't build a reactive defense. Because real-time detection does you no good if somebody has to press a button. Real-time response does you no good unless you know you need to respond to something. Then there are the static components. Static in terms of the time scale of a worm. These are still active things because these may be people involved. But for the purposes of what can the worm do, these are, these are static after or before the fact. Prevention. Prevention is our biggest tool today. Um, there's a lot that people are doing that they aren't. Um, diversity, system hardening, patch treadmill. These are all preventative static defenses. And we need to do them better. People need to use what they've got already. But that doesn't interest me as much because it's not quite as cool. Recovery, how can we restore operations as fast as possible in parallel without losing data? Um, disaster recovery is a slightly different problem. A disaster should not be universal. A disaster shouldn't take out Microsoft, um, Redmond, and Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, San Francisco in the same event. If it does, you have a bigger problem. But worms, on the other hand, shouldn't destroy hardware. Any hardware that a malicious attacker can destroy, well, you should talk to the vendor. They did something wrong. Many of the worms run code in administ administrator privilege, and they override or cancel the, some systems that are running on the, on the machine. Yeah. How, how are you going to avoid it with the alternative systems? When I mean recovery, I mean the physical hardware is undamaged, but the OS is corrupted beyond all recognition. So I need to completely rebuild every system in the building as quickly as possible. I was referring to the reactive uh, defense that you're referring to. I'll get to that in a second with the containment versus blocking. That there are defense strategies you cannot do on the end host because of the end host escalation problem. I'll talk about that later. Um, we writing the bias, uh, would you consider that to be a recoverable operation? or? Would I would consider that to be a flaw in the hardware. Um, any hardware system should be specified so that in order to reflash the BIOS, there's a little button on the back that you have to press. All you have to do is make it sure you press that little button. Or a lot of systems, you, have a, you flip a jumper and you can boot from a backup copy of the BIOS. 
So only about a third of the systems can you corrupt the hardware with a BIOS reflashing. Um, and they're getting better because they, they have to deal with uh, inadvertent misflashes. So most systems these days, you can prevent hardware damage, but not all. Um, tolerance is, of course, can you allow an infection for a period of time? If I'm running a student computer lab, my policy on worms is the big nasty worm hits the fan and I don't care. As long as I can bring up the system back in two, three, four days, that's fine. As long as the data is not, not destroyed. Um, because that doesn't need to be a high availability system. This can be in finer detail. Like, could you, as a company, say 50% of my workstation's non-functional is OK as long as I still have another 50%? Can I tolerate 50% infection? Um, and finally, the other components, attribution and retribution. Who did this? Um, attribution is interesting because it's really hard. Um, technologically, we attributed Melissa because there was initial posting of the worm that was traced back. Um, I love you, there were clues in the worm itself that led to the guy in the Philippines. Um, and Witty, our SIGCOM paper, we actually discovered patient zero. We discovered the identity of the system used to launch the attack. It turned out to be a retail ISP in Europe, so it was probably some random compromised bot. But so it never led back past that, as far as I know. But we were able to discover that. Um, layer 8 operations actually have been a lot more successful in attribution. Uh, Sasser, his friends gave him up for 250 grand worth of Microsoft money. And uh, Microsoft may not even have to pay the reward, because it turned out his friends were also script kitty virus writers. So uh, let it be known, if you're an evil malcoder, make sure your friends require at least a million bucks to sell you out. Um, question? Sorry. Um, the uh, reward has not worked for the so big male virus family, probably because the rumor is that one's associated with the Russian mob. And frankly, you could not pay me 250,000 to betray the Russian mob, because if you betray those guys, you're going to be uh, sleeping with the fishes. So uh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And with uh, the Morris worm was also attributed to Robert T. Morris through these layer 8 effects. He sent out an email going, oh, wait, oops, something wrong, oh, never mind. Um, when the worm was sent out, and uh, that was how they traced it back to him and started looking in his account. Um, even with attribution, retribution, actually punishing those responsible can be even harder. Um, there was no law against I love you in the Philippines. Um, even attribution may be insufficient for prosecution. We have no clue who wrote, uh, who wrote uh, um, Blaster. The only clue we have is who wrote the copycat of Blaster, and the guy got what? Uh, what? Tw 12 months? More than he, more than he actually uh, really deserved from a damage point of view, but it feels good to at least arrest somebody for that. Um, in terms of response mechanisms, there are two big differences, blocking and containment. Containment is detect that a system is infected and prevent it from attacking others. And this only works if completely deployed in a network domain, because it only protects others. And it can only work, I'll discuss later, on the LAN, TCPA, something else that gives you protection from the Worm, worm is running as administrator, it's blowing away your defenses. Blocking is detecting that an incoming communication is dangerous and stopping it before it can infect the host. And blocking you can run on the end host. Um, but blocking is harder. So I'll talk a bit later about scanning worm containment. This works great for, well, containment, that you can detect a worm spreading throughout the network and stop it very easily. <coughs> But it can't work for blocking. Um, so if you want to do blocking against scanning worms, you cannot use 
simple containment as your detector. You're going, going to have to learn something else as well. So one other concept that appears useful for defenses is signatures. Attack signatures are the ones we all, yes? So are you, it seems like you were suggesting that uh, partial containment is not useful. Right. Partial. But wouldn't it at least slow down the attacks? Uh, the problem is, is you need to slow it down by a couple orders of magnitude to make a difference. If the attack's going to compromise your network in five minutes and you have 50% containment, that slows it down to 10 minutes. Uh, the difference between five and 10 minutes for a human mediated response is irrelevant. So you pretty much need universal deployment for containment to work. Um, in terms of signatures, attack signatures we all know and love. Um, vulnerability signature can actually be described the vulnerability rather than attack, can actually take a two forms. First of all, is just a description of the vulnerable system. So one of the things I'll talk about later tries to get this information. Windows XP Service Pack 2 not patched since 10-1-2004. Uh, That's the vulnerable class of systems. Um, combine that with machine inventory. Now you know which systems to watch and which systems not to worry about. Um, or it can be a description of how to exploit a particular vulnerability. Uh, Symantec and other IDSs have been uh, building this in an ad hoc manner that the IDS has an analysis engine and the analysis engine is looking for particular exploits. Get default.ida with this much garbage. Is somebody attacking the code red vulnerability? Who cares what it is? That is the vulnerability you're describing, not the attack. And then there's the shield project here by, by Helen and her uh, group, which is for given a little more knowledge about the exploit, let's make a, or about the vulnerability, let's actually make a, a vulnerability signature description that runs on the end host. And finally, there's the notion of behavioral signatures. And these are either behavior necessary for a class of worms, so scanning. If you write a scanning worm, it must, by definition, scan. Or their behavior common to a class of worms. So a common behavior for Windows worms is not to transfer over the worm with the exploit, but to just start up a TFTP connection back and transfer over the worm body itself. That's a common behavior. There's common implementation errors. So one problem that worms sometimes experience is they end up overriding the file descriptor that referred to the open connection that it uh, exploited. So as a result, it cannot close that TCP connection back from the machine that infected it. And so if you see this chain of half open connections spreading through your network, that's a common implementation error or implementation optimization. And of course, there's also for a class of attacks, tainted control flow. So where the control flow has been affected directly by inputted data it signifies that it was probably an override or some other control flow attack. Um, some signatures only are, are useful for detection. So attack signatures tend to be very poor. These are very tool specific usually. So seeing an attack signature show up really doesn't tell you all that much. Um, vulnerability signatures are fairly useful, but not great, because they can only be used to detect attacks on known vulnerabilities. And one of my other biases in my work, I care about zero-day worms, because if I can detect zero-day worms, I can detect one-day worms. But the converse isn't true, so I really want to focus on on zero-day worms, so I personally have been focusing on behavioral signatures because they detect classes of attacks. Um, all signatures are potentially useful for response if they can be generated by automatic detection and analysis. If the magic signature fairy says, oh, this worm is running, here's an attack signature for it, I can use that as part of a defense. But I can't use that to detect that the worm exists in the first place. 
Some signatures also may only be useful for containment in a raw form. So like scanning worm containment, detecting scanning as a behavioral signature, you really can only use that as a containment oriented signature. So you can use it for detection or containment. So the next question is though, what are these time scales that I keep harping on? Because worms are fast. The record is 10 minutes for worldwide spread and some ecologies could support attacks short of a couple of seconds. Um, get the right vulnerability, you might be able to write a sub one second worm for internet widespread. Um, so how do we model adversaries with respect to time? So this is a concept developed by an Air Force colonel who had the following problem. He, Colonel Boyd, was a really bright eccentric, one of the old school military, um, served in Korea, and a really good fighter pilot. And he had this following question. He developed a mathematical model for describing fighter aircraft, the energy maneuverability principle. And it was a very good model, except it had a problem. The MiGs in Korea, on this on this model were vastly superior to the US aircraft. But the US pilots did so much better in the air. So why were the pilots able to do better with inferior planes? Part of it was doctrine, that the US had better air-to-air uh, -air doctrine. But part of it was the observation, the MiGs had cable controls. So in order to turn the plane, you had to grab the stick and shove it over and you were shoving on a cable that made the aileron go up. So it took a lot of force to turn the plane. The US planes used hydraulic control. So you do a little control, it goes the hydraulic pump, the hydraulic pump boosts the pressure and the aileron flips. Which meant the US pilots could do faster transitions. That a, U, a MiG pilot would be turn, 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 get exhausted while the US pilot was able to do faster transients and move fast change positions faster than his op opponent and therefore triumph. And this was the, pros the, the model he developed to explain this and it's primarily focused on the model of time as being critical factor. Um, Napoleon has this quote, space we can recover, time never. You can lose battles in space, you cannot lose a battle in time. So what, what he modeled was the OODA loop, which is really more this massive process where you've got your observations coming in, your implicit decision-making process. So these are the reflexes, the training, the conditioning, the, the, the intuition, the hunches. And then you have the explicit decision-making process and the action, actions. And what's really critical is these implicit paths, the implicit path on observation. Huh, what's that? Notice, track. Um, the implicit decision making, the snap decisions that people make. Because these cycles here are much faster than this cycle. So if you actually have to go, hmm, what do I do now? That puts you at a disadvantage. And the goal is to, to destroy your opponent's thought process, because if you can destroy his thought process, you win. And so in general, the fastest accurate OODA lip loop wins, and you need both. If you're fast but have no clue what's going on, you're just thrashing, you're spinning your wheels. If you know exactly what's going on, but moving with glacial slowness, slower than, the, slower than your opponent, you can very well lose. So both are critical. And it tells you how to attack your opponent because you attack as a decision making process. Avoid, confuse, or manipulate the ob observation. The evasion attacks on IDS. Slide under the radar. Take advantage of errors in analysis. And finally, just move faster than the opponent's reaction time. With attacks that will spread through the world in 10 minutes, I cannot rely on a person making a decision because by the time the person presses 
puts down his Diet Coke and presses the button, it may very well be too late. Um, and so I need to build automatic defenses. And literally what it is, detection, analysis, and response. When we're thinking of automatic systems, we have no separate orientation and decision making cycle. They're the same thing. There's no implicit versus explicit. It's all explicit, but it's all fast. Um, and communication in these systems is best treated as a special thing, directly from analysis engine to analysis engine, because, well, it's a simplification that makes life easier. In the conventional OODA model, communication out is action, in is observation. Um, and time is critical. Our defense must be faster than the worms if we want a reactive defense to work at all. And this has some implications. If we want to build a reactive defense, one of two properties must hold for our defenses. Either they use local information, so they decide entirely using local information what's going on, or they communicate faster than the worm can spread. Because with the entirely local information, I've got an advantage in time because, well, packet comes in, I do my decision making, packet goes out. So if I can use local information, I can win. Uh, if I can communicate faster than the worm can spread, at least I can theoretically win. Otherwise, our OODA loop will never work. That we must be faster or we must communicate faster or we must use just local information or we're dead. We can't make it work. Um, in general, our response time scales, our communication time scale and our defense should be order of magnitude faster. Could probably get away with a factor of two, factor of four, but we don't want a horse race. One of the problems I have with the notion of using a worm to stop a worm, if you're using the same type of worm, it's just as fast or just as slow. I want defenses to be faster. Um, some types of worms play to our benefit. Scanning worms, relatively slow. Slammer is the fastest scanning worm to date. An internet level response actually had about 30 seconds to do something. 30 seconds is actually a long time for an automatic system. Um, the hit list in meta server worms may be locally anomalous. Um, meta servers in particular. Google has started blocking worm related queries because people are writing worms targeting PHP servers that are querying Google to find new victims. And Google is restricting those searches. And so you could at least theoretically do that in real time. Um, and passive verbs are mostly probably slow. How does Google know that the query is uh, What it is is they're using heuristics. So in URL searches for specific types of URLs. Um, and more than a couple in a given period of time, Google will block you saying, uh, you seem to be infected. Um, they're mostly doing it not for security reasons, but just for load reduction. When you say faster than the attack, I mean, in what, in what scale or geographic scale? I mean, can I be slower locally, but then, you know, as it, as it spread, just cut off pieces of the network yeah. and be faster there? I mean, that's... As long as sort of the domain kind of where you're on. doing the defense. So if your defense domain is global reach, it's OK if you're slower in pockets as long as your global speed is faster. So as long as I can leapfrog it in some yes. areas, I'd be still OK. okay. Yes. Um, the problem I worry about is topological worms, especially in peer-to-peer -peer systems. Because these are basically, it's attack your neighbors in the overlay. Um, these are both fa probably locally stealthy, because these are systems you're already contacting before. And the vulnerability is probably looks kind of like a query, and you don't see very many things. And the time scales of a topological worm in a peer-to-peer -peer network are almost as fast as I could engineer a response, if not faster. Take a network like Cord. 
This overlay takes O of log n time to infect the entire overlay. Um, and what's worse is the peer-to-peer -peer systems, they try to make the overlay more structured with better knowledge of latency and everything else, which just makes the worm spread faster. So I do not know if internet scale homogeneous peer-to-peer -peer systems are defendable. And I have a hunch they aren't because I can't see local information detecting a worm unless you're really able to say, oh, this program's been infected, so detecting the exploit. Because the global time scales are just as fast as I can conceive of build, being able to theoretically build the defense. Because in the perfect peer-to-peer -peer overlay system that I'd build as the omniscient designer, the latencies for global reach are on the order of the network latency around the globe. So this may be indefensible. I don't know. It's one of my worries. The other part is, so we've got this time requirement of our defenses. If we want them reactive, has to be fast or local. The other question is where to put them in space, where to put them in the space on the network. And it's basically observing that a defensive reactive or monitoring point is a perimeter. That you've got a division of the world into inside and outside. Paths along the perimeter, paths around the perimeter. You can monitor, modify, and block anything on a checked path, nothing on an unchecked path, and there's a separate defensive perimeter around the control plane itself. A single penetration means you can never offer any guarantees about the inside state from this perimeter, but you can still monitor traffic, so the perimeter can still do some good. Um, penetration of the control plane, all bets are off. As the coverage increases, so as inside gets bigger, the likelihood of a breach never decreases, rather it all almost always increases. More users, more web surfing, more people running IE, more likely that some moron is running Kazan, double clicked on the malware that says run me please, get me through the firewall. Um, and you compose them to form your posture. Defense in depth is trying to compose perimeters. Containment attempts to limit the damage of breaches. And in general, I'll get to compositions in more detail, but I'd rather have low false positives than low false negatives because low false positives are more composable. And you can communicate. Perimeter can communicate information. And you can actually trust it as long as its control plane is intact. So how does the coarse grain perimeter fail? Uh, well, worms enter through VPNs. How many heard of the Dave Best nuclear power plant in Ohio? This was a nuclear power plant whose monitoring and emergency monitoring system was taken offline by Slammer. Yes, nuclear power plants are dependent on Windows and run Windows on their internal network. And it happened to get infected through some affiliated contractor who had a VPN link into the nuclear power plant and got infected with Slammer. Slammer went through the VPN, got on a machine in the nuclear power plant's network and basically caused the network to stop working. And the monitoring system therefore went offline. This was no problem because there were dials and gauges the operators could read. Um, am I the only one who finds that Windows running in nuclear power plants disturbing? No, because it's against the license agreement. Um, where does it say it in the license agreement? It says it should not be used for any mission critical operations. Uh, look at Xilinx license agreement. I'm, I'm, they explicitly. I'm being slightly sarcastic. But yeah. No, but actually, you should do better. Xilinx's license agreement specifically says no medical devices or nuclear power plants without express permission from Xilinx. I think we actually do talk about um, that and aircraft and a couple of other things. Yeah. But it's probably in about a two point font. Actually, I looked, I did a grep for nuclear, nuclear in uh, one of the EULAs I found, and it wasn't actually mentioned. Mission critical is definitely in Windows. Too late. Windows is critical infrastructure these days. 
Um, worms just walk around the firewall. Notebooks, mobile media. This actually occurred at a institution that a colleague's affiliated with. They observe, hey, there's Blaster, Welshy, I forget which one, or no, it may, it may have been Slammer, but worm traffic on the LAN. Where is it coming from? Because it triggered the intrusion detection system. Traced it back to somebody's notebook. No, the notebook wasn't infected. It had a wireless access or wireless card in it that happily configured itself as an open access point when plugged in. Somewhere outside the building, somebody had an infected notebook that went, oh, there's an open wireless access point. Let's associate with it. And worm traffic was therefore spreading into the internal network through some guy's laptop's wireless card. This is how the big bad firewall is 99.999% effective. Unfortunately, that is not enough to stop a worm these days. Because there's just so much traffic through these unchecked paths. And internal firewalls help, but may not be enough, because they still tend to be very coarse grained. These worms are insecurity gas. They'll penetrate through some second lieutenant plugging in his notebook at Starbucks against policy, and then plugging in to the classified network. We don't know what classified networks have been infected by worms, but we know they have been. And if you cannot protect a classified network, with the big coarse grain firewall, you definitely can't protect in a business. Um, the end host, as you mentioned, has the brittle failure problem. You've got this great visibility uh, over all traffic, but pretty much all bets are off because, let's face it, 90% of the users are still running as root. Um, the apps often dig into the system. It's pretty straightforward to escalate. Um, and once it's composed, it's all bets are off. A lot of proposed worm defenses are cooperative, use infected systems as other defenses. And as a result, you cannot perform reliable containment on the current end hosts. Um, Windows XP Service Pack 2 has two malcode containment features of note. No raw IP sockets. It took 48, or actually notes, there are raw IP sockets. You cannot send TCP or UDP through the raw IP sockets. It took 48 Not hours. True. What? Not true. You can send UDP as long as the IP addresses are OK. Right. You can't, the interfaces. you can't send TCP. Yeah, you can't send spoofed source UDP. Right. You can't send, yes. So it took 48 hours for the Nmap developers to work around this. They write raw Ethernet frames. Um, the TCP rate limiting, the peer-to-peer -peer community, peer-to-peer -peer applications that aren't structured scan because they go, Where, how do I rejoin the network? I just call a bunch of people I talked to before and try to connect to them. Because anybody who ran a rendezvous server would be sued by the RIAA. Um, and so that rate limiting uh, was bypassed by people writing, uh, hacking the TCP stack. There's an alternate TCP stack included with some peer-to-peer -peer programs these days. I think what you're missing there, though, is, is that we went from a situation with XPSP1 where 100% of the user base was exposed to that, to a situation now with XPSP2 where 99 or 95 or whatever percent of the community now is in a state where those containment features are there by default and for them to be removed they need to make a conscious decision and we can discuss the consciousness no, of the attacker in code needs to make the conscious decision and thus the attacking code can bypass it that that if i'm writing the zombie i can still write the raw ethernet frames and install the device driver you can just imagine endus.sys and winsock being replaced Right. Yeah, that, that could very well be part of the payload of the world. In fact, it's yeah, part of the bundles of the peer-to-peer -peer programs. I agree, but... Um... I mean, the principle is true that if, if, you know, if you're running code as in kernel mode as a system, yeah. all these defenses are window dressing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're window dressing, but there's, there's also other you know, aspects. I mean, uh, you know, as, as, as we see through Watson crashes and things like that, you know, 
the bad guys aren't actually that good at, at replacing kernel code. Um, you know, they typically take out machines, they cause blue, blue screens, they, ca they cause a user to reboot. So it's not necessarily reliable. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's a panacea and it solves the problem, but I'm saying we've moved from a situation whereby we've We've made a, 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 a move forward. Yeah, but the, the problem is, is you, is, and I have to apologize because I was asked about this a couple years ago. And I said it sounds like a good idea. I didn't realize how easy the bar was for the good authors to step over. That 48 hours for the good authors to bypass these defenses. All you're saying here is that you have a CPU that is, in, in, in some sense, in charge of a network connection. I yes. think, therefore, oh, I am. It doesn't work. Yes. Right. So it's not necessarily a problem just with Windows or anything. It's right. It is any time you can run the code yeah, that code can control a network interface. It is a systemic host. problem with trying to protect the system from within itself. I think, therefore, I am is totally bogus. Um, and. This is, I just use these as examples of well-engineered, well-designed containment <coughs> features being bypassed in very short periods of time. Um, so this software can only be used reliably for blocking, not containment, and is fairly limited in cooperative defenses because if I'm a worm, attack, a worm and it's a cooperative system of antivirus, I start running on the machine blow away that cooperative antivirus and start lying. So I'm infected in evil and I go, he's infected, everybody get him, as I go marching that way. So this is a problem. And finally, you've got the other problem of this can make the system less stable. That one of the nasty things about Witty was it was a worm attacking the antivirus IDS software on the incoming link. So you were vulnerable because you were running the security protection. And because you were running the security protection, your hard drives got deleted. Um, not a fun side effect. Um, so one thing that we're focusing on at, uh, at ICSI in particular is breaking the network into pieces and putting defenses into the local area network fabric. So um, the goal is to limit the damage as much as possible, limit the number of unchecked paths as much as possible, and get high visibility into the network. So 3Com, convince 3Com to put it in their switch ASIC. Separate devices in the LAN that are passing the packets through. NICs outside of the host control. People have built network interface cards with their own processors that run code that's not controlled by the host OS. So your network interface card contacts the server and downloads code from the server and runs it, regardless of what your host OS wants to do to it. How long before somebody fix that? As you said, if it's a processor controlling a network connection, your host. But right? If they infect that, they can't erase the hard drive because the, the uh, firewall, saw that CPU doesn't control the hard drive controller. So, so, some of those, you know, and I can't remember it's the three comp card specifically, but we've actually looked at some of them. They're actually running uh, a little uh, version of um, Apache. So you, 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 what you've done is you've offloaded yeah. your manageability problem. So how do you actually keep up with all the Apache updates on that um, device oh, no. and then yeah. stop that actually becoming oh, your host, your infected host? So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the same It at least does, it does separate responsibility somewhat, though, in that that host still doesn't control the end host itself. So you have to do a two-stage attack to get to the hard drive. Okay, so if you your hard drive, you still have to copy the Yes, you do. And, and probably a less manageable host because it's unlikely, unlike Windows, where you can do remote deployment, you're probably going to have to send someone out to you know, do some sort of firmware upgrade. Actually, uh, on those, you probably can because it downloads the program. That a lot of those download the firmware <coughs> on startup. So some of those are network booting. If the trusted computing base ever works, you can run it on the end host. 
but you're going to have to replace a good amount of the computing infrastructure. Because one of the problems with containment is, as I said, you need universal deployment within an institution. How many people, once Intel has the uh, uh, Legrand-based chips out with the VM in VM in VM tech ability to it, how many are actually going to actually replace every workstation in the institute? Um, this is research. This is what I've been thinking about, and it's giving me headaches because I need basically two orders of magnitude better cost performance than current network intrusion detection. I'm more familiar with network intrusion detection than host-based, and I don't like the idea of having to do two orders of magnitude improvement in cost performance. Um, but we've been thinking about hardware solutions. I'll talk about containment for scanning worms in a bit. We have a hardware-friendly algorithm for that. Um, so the final issue in the, these thought exercises is how does composability actually work? Well, you've got the false positives, trigger an alarm when the worm didn't exist, false negatives. And you've got the background rate that just happened, either because of some specific protocol being running or just due to, well, counting failed connections, sometimes you get unlucky. Um, you've got implementation errors, which an attacker can exploit to create a false positive or false negative, depending, once or a few times. So let's say if you send this magic packet, it causes the alarm to go off. That would be an implementation error that you could theoretically fix. Um, you have systemic errors, where an attacker with a given set of resources can cause a false alarm at will. Let's say, take hypothetically, I've got an incoming detector that detects scanning coming into my network. And when I see what looks to be a scanning worms now spreading, I cut off that port completely at the border and cut it off internally. This would be a worm defense that you could never deploy because any external attacker who can spoof packets can make your detector think that this huge worm is coming in. However, if instead you're detecting scanning outbound and then start panicking, well, the attacker already has to be within the institution, within your network. And so that's akin to setting off a burglar alarm from inside the building deliberately. I can stand a false alarm scenario where the attacker has to break into my building and then trigger the alarm. Because while he already is able to break into my building, he could do something more. But if the attacker can just tap on the window from the outside and trigger my alarm, then I turn off the alarm system. And our general worry here is network autoimmune disease and induced network autoimmune disease. That are we going to build things that will make the network worse? I don't know, but this is what worries me. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I just have the problem. Um, so in terms of actual comp composition, there's two co possible compositions. Given independent net detectors with independent false positive rates and false negatives. Serial composition is detector A, detector B. And either A or B triggers an alarm. This really reduces the false negative rate geometrically, but does an increase in the false positive rate, basically almost the sum of the two. Um, but also, this means that the attacker only has to trigger one of these. And then there's the parallel aggregation of, we've got noisy detectors. Let's only detect when both A and B trigger. And that reduces the false positive rate, but ups the false negative rate. Um, and basically what it is, is composition. So either a defense in depth composition or a aggregation is not a free lunch. You have to decide, is the cost of false positives too high, so we're going to up the false negatives, or vice versa. Um, and correlated errors, so if A and B make the same mistakes, this really blows away composition entirely. 
So it's just something to keep in mind when trying to, to layer these defenses. Um, and this is of particular concern and why we tend to like focusing on very low false positive rates because we like defense in depth, but defense in depth reduces our, or increases our false positive problem. So what does this say? Reactive defenses need to be fast, faster than the worm itself or local information. Um, the fabric for the defenses doesn't yet exist in many cases. Um, either everything in VMs, so if you're running your windows in VMware, now you can do your containment rather reliably because the attacker has to break VMware and whatever the host OS that's running VMware in order to get around the containment defenses. Um, or nicks and switches which support security applications that don't yet exist. Supporting applications that we don't know what to do yet. Um, but the problem is hard but not unsolvable. We can do compositions that help, not completely. And time scales in most cases are not insurmountable. From a human time scale, worms are very fast. But from a computer time scale, most worms are slow. 30 seconds is a long time. Yes. Uh, can you go back to slide? I don't agree with uh, the white worms are a good idea. But I don't agree also with that they're not fast enough. I, if you can begin a white worm with a large amount of infected hosts, for instance. Um, like the take, problem with a white worm is not the beginning, but that it tends to be running on the same time scale as the worm you're trying to displace. Uh, and I don't. You got, like worms that can grow exponentially. Right. Yeah. No, you can the fastest way to get a splash from the work. If, if you hit list and, and if you're using a different propagation technique, yes, you can make a white worm be faster. Well, like if you, for instance, start with the Microsoft Net, uh, CorpNet, you've got thousands of boxes to start with to go out. That's more yeah, the so. bandwidth limit on Microsoft's pipe. Yeah. Distributed set of like yeah. ISPs that started. But if you're going to do a distributed set, why not just do the distributed set to protect themselves and who cares about the rest of the net anyway? Uh, I was just saying I didn't yeah. agree with the speed. Um, there are, you are right, there are probably cases where you could re engineer the white worm to be faster. But this, that's also a response to all these papers I reviewed and seen showing graphs of a white worm propagating on the same time scale as the defensive worm. And I'm just going, I don't want a defense as a horse race. And I think the white worms that we've seen are also by coders who are just as bad as the Oh, yeah. Well, she, I don't consider a good thing. Taking out the Marines when the US is at war is not a good thing. It seems like uh, time scale is not as clear cut as you're suggesting. I mean, for instance, you could have uh, Sort of a filter which, uh, let's say, doesn't have very many false negatives, but potentially has false positives. So if you get, let's say, a web server and you get a request that uh, is matched by this filter, then you take a few extra seconds to talk to others in the network and find out whether it's really bad. Yes. We out. can change the time scale of the attack. And that, that, that helps it because we control the terrain as well. So there's actually two things we can do on the defense. Make our defenses faster or make the attack slower. Um, so, right. slowing sins. Uh, what you said about time scales, it sounds like if, if our response is slower than the worm, then it's hopeless. Yet, when you look at all these worms in the past <coughs> years, eventually they were stopped, even though the responses were. Good. But they were stopped long after they did all the damage that was coded in the worm itself. So, so what do you consider stopping it before? Like, what's, what's a good... Uh, my goal would be, say, take Blaster 3.0 that uses a zero-day Windows vulnerability and take Microsoft as a concrete example. My vision of stopping Blaster 3.0 would be less than 10% of the systems in Microsoft are infected, even though all are vulnerable. 
When I mean stop a worm, I mean prevent it from infecting a large set of the vulnerable machines. Oh, no, you're not aware. You you didn't learn the details yet behind that, right. Thing, right? So, as far as I know, there are a lot of trials in the industry to programmatically identify worms, and none of them is successful so far. Um, there have been a couple on the containment that work against behavior. I'll talk about those in a sec. Those work only against scanning worms, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. Are some strategies we and others have come up with on this front. So. I will hopefully convince you that there's hope. So the goal is reduce scanning worms to being a manageable threat. $50 per system per year works against zero day super blaster written by me and a cadre of my evil twins designed to be a zero day exploit against XP, et cetera, that uses scanning. That's the key. It goes and picks random addresses for some definition of random as its primary way of finding new targets. Um, note that Zero Day Super Blaster probably wouldn't do that. Zero Day Super Blaster would contact the domain controller and say, who should I pillage? So I'm not protecting against that. I'm only protecting against scanning. And protecting against both users and home users and businesses with a business system able to protect a worm that only targets that institution. The worm only spreads within Microsoft, I still want to be able to stop the worm. Um, and there are two major components network based scanning containment with a little bit of address tweak, and then Honey Farm described signature generation. So I'll give a brief overview of uh, these ideas. So, scanning containment, as I mentioned, is detect that a system's infected and block it after a little while. Um, based on the outgoing scanning behavior, limitations, you need universal deployment, so you can only use this within a business. Um, potentially a lot of devices. And you can only protect a network if there's a low density of vulnerable machines. Basically, the best we have is about, the address can be about 10% populated. So if one in 10 addresses are vulnerable machines or less, you're good if, say, it's all vulnerable machines, you aren't going to be able to do a thing. Um, the benefit, this would actually work. Um, and we're testing it right now. So you break the network into these pieces called cells. Within a cell, the cell being our perimeter boundary, within our perimeter boundary, we have no guarantees. Worm comes in. Now it can do anything it wants within. But our goal is to convect or prevent this cell from infecting others. And you basically have this epidemic threshold. If a worm copy running within the cell is expected to find more than one victim, it will still grow exponentially. If it's expected to find less than one victim, it will grow logarithmically and die out. So if we spread this containment all throughout the institution, one cell gets infected, it may infect one more, maybe two more, and then the worm basically stops spreading. Um, and there's a few implementations. There's the Williamson virus throttle, which has two limitations. The first limitation is it doesn't actually block completely. It only just slows it down. But the bigger problem is a sub-threshold that it allows one scan per second. And one scan per second within an enterprise is still too much. You still have these few minute doubling rates, which we don't like. Um, counter malice no longer exists. There's a couple of companies doing dark address detectors. That is, rather than detecting scanning, detect when a local machine is contacting an address in the land that doesn't exist. Um, our algorithm, where I'll talk about in a second, that's designed to be hardware friendly. In general, these will false positive on unstructured peer-to-peer -peer applications without rendezvous points because these systems are scanning and I'd hope you'd trigger on it. Um, TRW-based systems like ours and Jaeyoung Jung's will not false positive on peer-to-peer -peer systems that include a rendezvous point. 
So pretty much any legal peer-to-peer -peer system that you can come up with won't false positive these detectors. All those used for doing pirated images except, or pirated sounds and videos, those would uh, false positive these detectors. You can tell how much I care about that false positive. Um, so I'm not going to describe the algorithm. The algorithm's in the paper. I'll describe the design goals again. That for a LAN application, you only have to do one read and one write to a large table, and then one read and one write to a very small table that can be associated with the MAC table you need for routing in a switch. Um, for internet-based scanning to keep out the script kitties, you can get away with uh, two reads and writes. So two locations, a read and a write. Um, less than 16 megabyte memory for access link, less than 4 meg for LAN. And right now we're seeing just how small a memory footprint we can make. Um, we hope to get it down into a few tens of kilobytes for LAN application. Um, can detect and block after 10 scans. So the epidemic threshold is 10%. So if there's fewer than 10% vulnerable machines based on address in the institution, it will do well. And the sub-threshold rate, that is the worm goes, I want to scan below the radar, one scan per minute. And so if you want to go slower than my detector, your worm's going to spread like uh, doubling time in the many minutes to hours. And that's still not great, but it puts it down onto a time scale that I know I can deal with as a person. Um, with a little tweak, you can make it so that existing connections are never blocked, and that you can do a TCP connection to a blocked machine for recovery. Um, aliasing, this is an approximate algorithm. The cheats only create false negatives, not false positives. So by cheating, we made the decision any cheat should only increase the false negative rate, not the false positive rate. So we made a decision to do single-sided error. And uh, we're currently implementing as a click module so people can run it as at 100 megabits in cheap software boxes so that you could build a $300, $400 little box that could run it at 100 megabits. Um, we'd love a switch vendor to do this into hardware at a gigabit plus. Um, but there's a problem here. If your threshold of response is set too high, the worm will still spread. If it's set too low, then false positives really start becoming a problem. Um, and so the solution is a little cooperation. So you start at a high threshold. Um, and when you shut down a cell, you notify everybody else. Um, and the other cells respond by lowering their threshold before they are infected. And since scanning worms are slower than my time scale of sending out this help message, I should be OK. Um, and even a little communication makes a big difference. And if the time scales aren't OK, I can slow down uh, sins. Just slow down every sin by a half a second. And now this gives me a vast increase in time scale for my uh, counter response to work. But even this may not be sufficient. The solution is to use NAP that observe that most machines don't need to be externally reachable. So let's assign my network for internally from the private slash 10 or slash 8, um, which is 10 dot whatever. Um, and now I can really reduce the density because I've got this 24 bits of address space to assign machines from. And now anybody who tries scanning through the network is just going to have such an inefficient time that I'll be able to detect them really easily. Um, so that, yeah? Do you think as we move to uh, IPv6, a lot of that? IPv6 kills scanning unless people clump their address space. IPv6 helps MetaServer because I think it's service location protocol. Basically, IPv6, in order to handle the address space, adds more meta servers, systems that you ask it, it'll tell you about everything else in the network. Trade off. Um, 
So the other thing that we're working on is honeypots as worm detectors. So if we have k vulnerable honeypots across the internet, we're actually very sensitive when about one kth of the internet is affected. So we actually only need about 100 or 1,000 honeypot addresses, not necessarily full honeypots, but just addresses scattered across the internet to make a very sensitive detector. Um, this only works for scanning worms, human attackers, but we can't do this. Do you want to really shove a thousand honeypots all over the world, administer them, and trust them knowing that it only takes one to raise an alarm? There's no way. So the key is to separate out the endpoints. We want something that looks to the world like distributed honeypots in a large number, but is really a centralized system. And so we separate the endpoints. The endpoint's responsibility is routing traffic, and the central system's responsibility is raising an alarm. So um, the, the endpoints are either small address endpoints, wormholes, just little boxes that you hand to people, or telescopes, large address ranges. So we're starting to build this with a slash 16. So we'll have a slash 16 worth of addresses going to this. And we create honeypots on demand and route internal traffic into other honeypots. So what happens? Well, traffic comes in. When traffic comes in, you reconfigure the honeypot so that it thinks it's at that address. So the honeypots exist but are basically not hooked up. You hook it up to that address and let the communication proceed. So the signal, however, is traffic that's then subsequently generated by this. Let's say this system starts scanning outwards. What do we do? Well, rather than letting it go out to the internet, let's send it against another honeypot and see what happens. Um, and our current status is we're actually starting to build this. Uh, we've got the machines on order. Um, and so what can you learn from this? Isn't it, some, this uh, isn't it vulnerable to people actually finding out the IP addresses of the honeypots? That is one of the reasons why what we specifically want is not just the telescope, but the wormhole boxes. That a box that just plugs into the network, grabs its IP address through DHCP, and sets up a little tunnel to my honey farm system. And then keeps changing the address over time. It doesn't even need to do that, because if I have a 1,000 or, or of these boxes spread around the net, in order for the attacker to walk around my detector, he has to know where a lot of them are. So the goal is to make the th secret sort of distributed and worthless. Not to mention, you just unplug them, plug them back in, grab a new lease randomly. The IPs hop all over the place anyway as a result. But the goal in that case is to um, make endpoints where the attacker would have to gather a lot of information to walk around. But yes, that is one way the attacker can avoid this system. So what can we learn? Well, we can detect a new worm. Yes? Sounds like you have another concern that if you use a true virtual machine, because x86 isn't quite virtualizable, the worm can detect that it's running inside, say, VMware yes. or a virtual PC. And Currently, we to can. The, payload. the next generation of Intel processors, we can avoid that. Because the next generation has real virtualization support, the, the Legrand stuff. Um, also, VMware, it's pretty easy because by default there's the nice ballooning driver and stuff like that. Um, we're accepting that for the moment. Our plan is how we handle that in the future is the real virtualization for x86. So that's one of the, the ways attackers can get around it. Um, but assuming the system works and the attacker isn't flying under our radar, um, and we can also counter it by having a few physical machines. So if you have a few actual Windows boxes running on it, going, hmm, this thing looks like it might be, looks like it's infecting something, but it's shutting down. It may be detecting VM. Let's try it against a real system. So we have both of those ways of handling that problem. 
Um, we aren't going to worry about that in year one. That's year two, year three worries. But what can we get from it? Vulnerability signature, types of configuration including patch level. Knowing that Windows XP that got patched today is safe, but that didn't get patched by today is vulnerable is actually very useful because you could conceive of building a response in your IT department where what you do is you take all the Windows patches. You put them in a holding zone and start running your regression tests on them. If the worm comes out, after you've already done your regression test, it doesn't matter because you pushed it all out to the desktop. If the worm comes out before your regression testing is complete, your detector, somebody says this is the vulnerability, your network says, okay, all these systems are VLAN just to the patch server. I'm going to push out the patch now and then reconnect them. So you're doing the, I want to make sure the patch works, but if something's gone wrong and I need to patch now, I can. So just knowing what systems are vulnerable down to patch level is useful information. Uh, we should be able to determine overt immediate malicious behavior. If it starts erasing the hard drive, we should be able to tell that. Um, the goal is to get attack signatures because we've got common strings from all infection instances. So is there a common string for all these instances or a subset of these instances that would act as a block for this attack. And we can test it because we know what configurations are vulnerable. Automatically challenge another honeypot with the same configuration but with the block in place. Now this is an attack signature that would work. Um, works best for human attackers and scanning worms. Scanning worms are slow enough that we have the reaction time and random enough that they'd actually find the honeypots. Um, and so this is a system that we're starting to develop. Um, we've thought about it a lot. We only got funding a couple of months ago. Um, so once you get the signature, it's now time to push it to the end hosts. So eh, one second to most user, five seconds to all users who are at least willing to pay. Um, this doesn't come free. Somebody has to pay for it. Um, and I think it's possible with a nice overlay network based on Akamai or something where you've got a few limited entry points. So, you, so the overlay only accepts communication from a couple of systems, sends it into the overlay, verifies the signature, pushes it out to the end hosts, and the end hosts also verify the signature. And this gets us to the latency of the best engineered overlay network plus uh, three cryptographic verifications and one signature creation. So we should be able to get a one to two second time to broadcast a signature to most of the paying customers. And then the customers have an idle but open TCP connection to the overlay. And the overlay sees, oh, signature pushes it down to the end hosts. So this looks plausible. Do we agree that it's plausible? So in conclusion, worm defense is hard, but I don't think it's impossible. So I think I've convinced you we have a story on scanning worms. Um, scanning worms are the most common, the easiest to write. Getting rid of that is going to be a good thing. Um, I think there's a systematic way of thinking about defenses. What are the pieces? How they fit in time and space? And also where we might want to give up. I don't want to defend peer-to-peer. Um, I'm not sure if I can. I don't want to defend sensor nets because I'm not sure if it's possible there um, for the same reason. I don't have the monitoring and the communication of the sensor net is the same fabric that the defense would be at. Um, so that's the primary one. Since that was longer than I expected, I'm going to probably just skip to the more controversial ones on what I think would be interesting from Microsoft's viewpoint. Oh, that was stupid animation. Sorry. Um, so you guys have amazing technical resources. God, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, you control the OS. 
you have a reason to sell security as part of the OS because people need to upgrade. Um, no upgrade, no OEM sales. No OEM sales, no Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft's strength is really with the morons who are running 90% of the computers in the world. And we have to protect them from themselves. And you guys are great at dealing with those people. I don't know how you do it, but um, the weakness, Microsoft is the number one target. Windows is critical infrastructure no matter what you say. It's running in nuclear power plants. It's running in network connected medical devices. The USS Ronald Reagan is running a Windows based control system. Uh, he did die of Alzheimer's, but somebody seemed to have forgotten when uh, designing its, uh, that aircraft carrier's controls. Uh, the Na who here remembers the USS Yorktown incident? Aegis cruiser dead in the water for, what, 40 minutes due to a blue screen of death in NT? That hasn't stopped uh, the US military from building weapons based on Windows. Um, during recovery, Microsoft's defenses may be the only defenses. If I have to put a new machine, restore a machine by reinstalling the OS, the only defenses I got beyond by the little NAT box that I'm smart enough to ha steal from my home box is whatever's on that OEM install desk. Um, Internet Explorer is a pit, um, and defenses don't exist yet. Um, personally, I want somebody to be able to go to Walmart, buy a computer, plug it in, and start web surfing without being owned. You can't do that today. You run Internet Explorer before you start doing the patches, you're dead. If you're running pre-service pack two happens to be the install media, you're dead. Um, and the only reason why service pack two isn't dead upon plugging it in is because uh, there is no worms for the default installation yet. And I'd like to hope that the firewall configuration is good enough that there won't be. I wouldn't want to bet on it. Um, and it's corporate nightwear for install. When Welsh hit, UC Berkeley had to pull the remote install image of XP because the remote install image of XP would download the OS, download, start it running, get the patches down, apply the patches. And in that window between when the OS started up and when the patches were applied, systems were reinfected. Um, I'd love to see this happen. I'm not sure what are all the real nightmares in it. But basically, have the install disks um, be safe. That it obtains D Once you plug it into the net, it obtains DHCP IP address, contacts the Windows Update or the local proxy, installs all patches, and will not allow IE to connect to the internet until the patches are installed, will not allow anything else to listen to the internet. The behavior has to be bypassable, but the user has to click the I am a moron and want to run my system in unprotected mode until the patches are installed. You make the warning message suitably obnoxious and terrifying, and 90% of the users will actually wait the five hours it takes for all the stuff to download over the dial-up link. Um, I think this is needed ASAP. I think the, my hunch is the OS has the capabilities. I think it's all configuration. Um, um, basically, we need the sh only sure way for recovery is reinstallation, and we need to make reinstallation possible. Um, I will not let my mom and dad buy a Windows box because I don't want to have to walk them through setting it up and resetting it up if something goes wrong. Um, as a corollary, what I'd love to think is, what love to see is the safe, safe boot or safe startup supplemental CD, akin to the free service pack two CD. Um, I've got my free service pack two copy. Thank you very much. Um, really nice. What I want is something that my mom can use. Instructions: disconnect from the internet. Use the system restoration disks, put this disk in, and all will be well, because it puts it into the safe startup configuration. 
Or better yet, you put in the safe startup disks and then put in the random OES reinstall disks that are these nightmares, but uh, what you're given, and make it work. Um, I'd love to see this. I don't know if it's going to happen. It would probably be too much work. This talk is full of my dreams and delusions. So take everything I say with a mountain of salt. One thing that I'd also might be interesting from the antivirus point of view, now that Microsoft owns an antivirus software company, is an antivirus program designed to deal with next generation rootkits. Um, remember, I may be totally bogus here, um, but if I'm a Malcode author, I'd be looking so hard at these rootkit technologies. And yes, I'd be blue screening windows, but if I blue screen it half the time, but the other half of the time I make myself impossible to remove, I'm willing to kill half the population in order to, to achieve this dig in like a tick ability of a rootkit. Um, Antivirus needs a way of recovering, and the only way the antivirus can really recover from this is if it boots on its own from CD. Um, so it boots a memory resident OS image, connects to the upgrade server through the net, gets the signatures it needs to look for, looks through on the disk, um, scans the disk, checks for the firewall, checks for the configuration. It's not needed today. Um, I don't think it's needed today, but I think it may very well be needed tomorrow. And this is one of the pieces you'd want to put in place today for when you need it tomorrow. And also, Microsoft is the best to do it. All the other antivirus companies, they have to deal with reading NTFS in their own way, all this nightmare stuff. That It's meat and potatoes for Microsoft. You guys own the OS. You know how everything works. Um, so. It's a nightmare for Microsoft to build. It's a double nightmare for Symantec to build. And it would be nice to build it now before something catastrophic happens, just so that when something catastrophic happens, you gain more customers. OK, I'll be wrapping up. Let's see, last response points in the OS. You're already <laughs> building them. Security of thought out. One more thing I'd love to see. Windows Netboot Edition. Um, CPU is free, RAM is free, disk space is free, and the LAN is empty. But the disk access takes forever, and reliable storage costs me an arm and a leg. You priced a NetApp recently. All the failures are involved moving parts. Fans, power supplies, disks. Can get rid or fans, disks. The fans in the power supply and on the CPU. And the individual desktop's a nightmare. Terminal services model is even worse, in my opinion, because you're taking, creating an artificial scarcity of CPU and RAM, which is supposed to be free. Um, and so distribute what's free, centralize what's expensive, and bring back the network booting workstation. Everybody remember the Sun 350s? Weren't they utterly vile? They were vile once they started swapping, but until they were not, then they were nice. And network has grown better than disk anyway. Um, you can build PCs with no moving parts. OS rollout, rollback is a reset away for all the desktops. You can actually do patch and pray. Go, here's the new patched image. Push it out to everybody's desktop. Oh bleep, it's not working. Here's the old image. Have everybody hit the big red button. And you're back to where you were before. It trains people to do the right thing because they can't save to their local desktop and they can't save on the local machine because it goes away every night when the machines reset. And you can't permanently compromise the end host systems because those get reset. So it improves recovery and may improve tolerance. I'd love to see this. How do we get there? Um, why does network booting work in Linux or Unix or BSD? Clear separation of state. I don't want to determine what in the registry is temporary state, permanent read only state, or permanent rewrite state. Um, if you force me to do that, I'll take a bullet to my head first. Um, we can't re-engineer Windows. So either steal Zen and do para-virtualization on top of BSD, or 
port virtual PC to BSD and make a nice little stripped down BSD kernel that just boots, maybe has a Windows driver emulator so that the BSD kernel can run Windows. All these OS modification, hey, it's a Berkeley licensed product. You guys don't have to tell anybody what you did. Um, and so this is something that I would love to see done, is Windows Netboot Edition. Um, otherwise, if I was administering a Windows system, I'd be buying a hell of a lot of VMware licenses, just simply because it's the only way I can think of to deal with it. So I think that's good enough for now. So more questions, comments, tomatoes?